Now will you turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 6 and there we continue our study which we have been engaged in for a few Sundays now of the Sermon on the Mount. Let me begin by confessing to you that I think I know of no passage of the Bible which is more disturbing and more uncomfortable to read than this particular part of Matthew 6. I imagine the whole of the Sermon on the Mount is like that for many of us as we have read it. We have found that it has exposed and challenged us in so many different ways. But there is a special sense in which this particular part of the sermon unveils and uncovers and touches areas of our life which are particularly sensitive. Particularly, I think, it reveals how much of our life as Christian people can be controlled, really, by self-interest rather than by the honor and glory of God. As we turn to it, you may remember that in the previous part of the sermon in Matthew 5, Jesus has been setting down a comparison for us between the righteousness which he wants to mark out the members of his kingdom with the false teaching of the Pharisees. So we have had this long list of occasions where he says, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, but I say to you. And we have discovered some of the distortions of true righteousness which the Pharisees taught. Now in chapter 6, verses 1 to 18, Jesus is comparing that true righteousness with the false practice of the Pharisees. The chapter opens with a general warning about the kind of danger Jesus is going to elaborate in these first 18 verses. The verse is excellently translated, I think, by the Revised Standard Version in this way. Beware of practicing your piety before men in order to be seen by them. The NIV says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. The authorized version speaks about almsgiving in verse 1. And the word almsgiving is, of course, just the word righteousness in general, in the sense of piety. And so important was almsgiving to the Jew that the two words became almost interchangeable. The great danger, then, against which Jesus sounds this warning, beware of practicing your piety before men in order to be seen by them, is the danger of a spiritual life which is purely public, which is more concerned with successfully maintaining an image than with developing an inner character. That, of course, is the focal point of the parable with which the Sermon on the Mount ends. You remember that vivid story Jesus tells of the two people who are building, one taking no care with the foundation, which is the hidden area, of course, but builds immediately upon the sand. The other digs down, no matter how long or how arduous the task, until he finds a solid, hidden foundation. And then he builds his house. And in the storm, one of these houses collapses in catastrophe. And the other one stands against the elements 
And Jesus paints the picture of two lives, of course. But the reason that one of these houses fell was that it was a great outward show with no foundation. And great, the Sermon on the Mount ends with these ringing words of Jesus, great was the fall of it. Now it's this theme that Jesus elaborates in three directions in this passage we read this evening. And there is a great deal of symmetry about the way the teaching is constructed. You can follow it very easily. Uh, he deals first of all with almsgiving and service in verses 2 to 4. Secondly, with prayer in verses 5 to 8. And thirdly, with fasting or self-denial or self-discipline in verses 16 to 18. Now you will notice how comprehensive is this coverage of Jesus' concern about this principle of a spiritual life which is purely public. The whole realm of almsgiving is our relationship to other people. The realm of prayer is our relationship to God. And the realm of fasting or self-discipline is clearly our relationship to ourselves. So in an outward, manward direction, in a Godward direction, and in an inward direction, Jesus is laying hold of this problem that we have of a spiritual life which is purely public. If you look more closely at the passage with me, you'll see that in each of these cases there is both a negative and a positive emphasis on the teaching. Look at verses 2 and 3, for example. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. Then verse 3, the positive teaching, but when you give to the needy, do it this way. The same with prayer in verses 5 and 6. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. That's the negative side of the teaching. Verse 6 is the positive. When you pray, do it this way. The same is true of fasting in verse 16. When you fast negatively, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. Verse 17, but when you fast positively, put oil on your head and wash your face and so on. Then you will notice that each of these sections bears reference to the Pharisees. They are the negative warning. And in every case, Jesus gives some indication that the Pharisees are an example to be avoided. When you, when you give alms, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. They are the Pharisees. Verse 5, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues, and so on. Verse 16, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. And in every case, again, there is a solemn word of warning about the spiritual consequences of such a life. The end of verse 2, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. The end of verse 5, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. And the same at the end of verse 16. And finally, each section ends with a promise of the Father's reward for those who seek it. His interest apparently is entirely concentrated upon the hidden secret areas of our life. He is not impressed by our public image of ourselves, but rather with what he sees in secret. And so Jesus says at the end of verse 4, Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And you get the same at the end of verse 6 and the end of verse 18. The principle of reward that Jesus is speaking about seems to be that those who seek it from men get none from God.
Now, it's obvious that one of the central words in this whole passage is the word hypocrite. What Jesus is doing is saying to the disciples, the one thing you want to avoid in every area of your spiritual life, manward, Godward, and inward, is hypocrisy. The Pharisees are shining examples of it. Do not be like them, says Jesus. The distinctive feature of true Christian living, therefore, is reality instead of hypocrisy. Now you will know, I'm sure, if you hadn't heard it from any other source, you're bound to have heard me saying it, that the word hypocrite is really the word in the Greek language for an actor. The whole idea, of course, is this is somebody who plays the part. You can see how it fits in so happily into what Jesus is wanting to convey. The hypocrite is just the actor who appears on the stage and gives a performance. But of course, when you have somebody who is giving a performance on a stage, you know that when you go round backstage, as we say afterwards, you're going to find a different person altogether. He's not intending to be the same person on the stage as he is behind the scenes. And people will applaud in ancient Greece. They would say, splendid performance. What an excellent hypocrites he is. An excellent hypocrite. A convincing performance. And they were not being insulting. They were just saying the man was doing what he was trying to do and doing it well. He was giving a good exhibition of somebody he was pretending to be and wasn't probably in this particular period they had masks which they wore and the masks were intended to represent somebody else but nobody expected that they were the real thing and you see how Jesus says how easily this kind of thing can creep into your spiritual life. Now, my dear friends, if you are saying right now, ah, yes, that may be true for some people, but not for me, then I say to you, you neither know very much about yourself or about the devil. Because it is one of the subtlest and most sinister things in our Christian experience. The whole language indeed follows the theatrical metaphor, the much repeated phrase to be seen of men is really the same word from which our English word theater is derived. And you can see the idea. The Pharisees used the synagogue as a theater where they won reputations for piety, you see. And Jesus says the true theater in which the child of God lives is the secret presence of his Father. And that's the only audience that really matters to him. Now, to the specific matters that Jesus illustrates in this great problem of hypocrisy, unreality in our spiritual life. Let me just say to you that the whole atmosphere of it is an atmosphere that I think is best captured in the word detachment. It is a detachment from reality the same as the detachment between the player and his true self. It is forever personified, of course, in the life of Judas Iscariot, who went through the whole of that period of Jesus' ministry associated with the Master, identified with him indeed, numbered with his company, even promoted to a position of some importance amongst them. And yet what was happening in the man's life is that more and more 
His deepest, inmost being was being detached from Jesus and from his deepest purposes. Now, it's so easy for that to happen in any of our lives. But of course, I need not point out to you from Judas as well as from here that the result of such a spiritual life is total disaster. First, Jesus turns to the realm of almsgiving. As I was saying, to the Jew, of course, the giving of alms was the most sacred of all duties, and as far as the outward act was concerned, of course it was something of enormous importance, of great spiritual importance, because I would imagine that there are few signs of the grace of God that are more convincing than the sign that somebody is touched by God to care for other people. And this almsgiving was an evidence of that. That's why it was such a common and such an important thing that uh, the heart of a man or woman should be hitherto shut tight against other people and their needs and now would flow out in love and care and sacrifice for them. But do you notice how Jesus uncovers the reality behind this particular sham? And let me emphasize to you that it is important not to confine this to giving. That is the giving of money although that is the particular instance, because the principle applies to all forms of Christian service. And the reality that Jesus uncovers in the case of the Pharisees is that their service is all part of a performance. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. Now, Nobody's very sure what these trumpets were. They were possibly the trumpets in the synagogue, and they waited until the trumpets were being sounded and made sure that they were there. It was something that called attention to themselves. That was the point. And their service is really all part of a performance. When they gave to the beggars or to the needy, they gave, says Jesus in verse 5, to be seen by men, not because they cared for them. In fact, the beggars were just the necessary stooges in the performance that they were going through in order to be seen by people. They were, in fact, not giving anything to anybody. They were buying something. And what they were buying was a reputation. Do you see? A reputation for piety. And everyone, of course, responded. People would say, what a godly man. What a marvelous thing to do. And that's exactly what they wanted them to say. And I say again, the language that is used even in describing it as the language of a transaction, they were buying something. And what they did, they did to be seen of men. Now, the reason this is so searching, you see, is that it makes us ask a question about our Christian service. And the question is this. Do I need to be seen by men in order to be faithful to God? That's the question. Because it's that question that explores and exposes the motive behind our service. 
Is my service a glad giving of myself and my substance to God without stint, out of a profound sense of indebtedness to him and a strong desire to glorify and honor him? Or is my service really a means of gaining a reputation? That, of course, is a question that people whose ministry is more public need to ask in a special sense. You will readily recognize that that is the temptation which is peculiarly close to people like myself who are involved in public ministry. But I want to say to you, it is a question that every single one of us needs to ask of God and of ourselves. Is my service such that I need to be seen by men in order to be faithful to God. This incidentally affects our attitude to the places where we are willing and glad to serve God. Do you ever notice that there are often people who are very eager to serve God in places that they would regard as significant and important, usually in the public eye. But they are not at all keen to be serving God in a place where they are totally hidden away from public gaze. Is it to be seen of men? The question is the kind of thing Jesus is clearly, deeply exercised about. And the point about it is that true service for God never does draw attention to man. It draws attention to God. That's the issue. And if there is one thing that is a test of all forms of Christian service, it is precisely this. If it's true, it draws attention to God and not to man. I remember someone I know well and respect greatly telling me how he had been at a large gathering somewhere in Britain. And after it was over, there were people coming out around him. And when the speaker had finished, they were walking out to the door saying, What a man! And my friend said he couldn't help asking in his own heart, Who? Him? Or Jesus. That's the first area, and here's the second. In verses 5 to 8, and you will realize that the Lord's Prayer is really an extension of this second area of Jesus' teaching, he concentrates on the area of prayer. I suppose that there is no place where the spirit of the Pharisee is more devastating than in the place of prayer. The kind of thing that Jesus is referring to, of course, in verse 5, is the habit of the Pharisee in making sure that he was in a public place at the hour of prayer. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. Now, clearly it is not prayer in public that Jesus is warning against. Rather, it is that kind of prayer which is designed for the ears and admiration of men rather than for the ears of God. That's what he is speaking about. And of course, we all of us know how easy it is to use or perhaps to abuse prayer in order to gain some kind of approval from men rather than to speak to God. That is the root 
of praying in public for things that we do not really want. But we think it would be spiritual to want them if we did, and so we say we do. You got that worked out all right? It's a real snare, my dear friends. Praying for something we don't really want. You think it'd be spiritual to want it if you did, and so you say you do, and the motive is to be heard by men. But you know it can be much more subtle than that. We can recognize that the mark of a godly man is that he would spend a great deal of time alone with God. We can know that it would be the mark of a godly woman that she would be known as a woman of prayer. And we want that reputation. And it's significant how we can get it. Let me give you an illustration. I knew a student in a university that I used to visit quite a bit some years ago now. And people used to come to me and talk to me about him. Do you know so-and-so? They say, well, I said I've heard of him, but I don't know that I've met him. You know, he spends about three hours every day alone in prayer. And I was deeply impressed, genuinely, because I'm bound to tell you that it's not often that I spend that amount of time in prayer. And I was greatly impressed. And one day somebody told me the same story again and said to me, you must come and meet so-and-so. And I was actually on my way because I was at that university to meet him when something quite simple suddenly struck me. How did they all know that he spent three hours alone in prayer? Answer? Well, you know the answer. The only way they could have known was that he had told them. Now, notice what Jesus says. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, he is not saying don't go and pray with other people. What he is saying is when you pray, shut the door against every other consideration except this one, that your Father in heaven is the only one who really matters when you're praying and you're going to wait upon him and shut out everything else. According to Jesus' teaching, the wise thing for him to have done would have been to let nobody know. Close your door on other people and their opinions. Close your door on reputation mongering and admiration seeking. Shut out every other consideration except your Father. And you will be truly yourself there. That's the point, you see. And that's where you will really make an impact. Because your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. It was old Professor Finlayson of the Free Church College in Edinburgh who once said, the secret of Christian failure is all too often failure in secret. Here's the third area where Jesus focuses our attention. It's in the realm of fasting, verses 16 to 18. As I say, you will recognize that the Lord's Prayer and the introduction to it is really an extension and expansion of Jesus' positive teaching on how we are to pray. We considered that fairly fully quite recently, and so we are not going to go into it in detail at this time. 
Let me turn with you then to this area of fasting. I suppose it's the sphere in verses 16 to 18 with which we are least accustomed. It is an unfamiliar sphere to most of us, but it is simply the disciple's attitude to himself, his self-discipline and self-control and so on. Somebody has said that Fasting is unpopular, not because it is unbiblical, but because it's uncomfortable, and I'm sure that is entirely true. But it is associated basically in the Scripture with two things. It's associated, first of all, with repentance and self-humbling. I humbled my soul with fasting. And it's associated, secondly, with prayer. This kind, says Jesus, does not come out except by prayer and fasting. Now, there is no doubt that it is something that perhaps we need to think about more seriously in our own generation. But the Pharisees, you see, had made fasting a substitute for true piety and for true godliness. And so it became a disguise that they wore. They wanted people to see that they were engaging in this outward act. But the self-denial and the self-discipline which fasting was to be an expression of was missing from their lives. Indeed, it was self-advancement and self-discipline play that they were interested in. How do we know? Well, notice what Jesus says. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. It may be that you will know that when they fasted, they um, put ashes on their head, a strange kind of uh, idea. But they did this, and probably that's one of the things that is described in uh, Jesus' disfiguring of their faces. But what they were doing was drawing attention to the outward action. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. That's a very interesting statement that occurs three times. What he is saying is, this is what they have sought after. This is what they are looking for, you see. Now, my dear Christian friend, if this is what you are looking for, self-display, self-advancement, reputation-mongering, and admiration-seeking, you'll get it. But that's all you'll get. They have received their reward in full, says Jesus. And these are dreadful words. In other words, such a man or woman is going to have their house left to them desolate. And it's an appalling thing if all you have in the end of the day is the admiration of men and women. But it's possible for us to have exactly the same concern in many different forms and ways. We want to engage in self-display and self-advertisement. May I quote to you some of the words of William Still on this, which I have never forgotten since I first heard them. It is the natural thing done spiritually and the spiritual thing done naturally which is the mark of the true child of God. It is the natural thing done spiritually and the spiritual thing done naturally which is the mark of the true child of God of God. And whenever our concern is to put on some kind of pose to impress people, that is when we are 
in the gravest possible danger. Well now, what is the root of this whole matter as we come to the conclusion of what Jesus is saying? I think what lies at the root of it is what lay at the root of the Pharisees or the hypocrites' great problem in life. It's expressed in one of their prayers. Do you remember the Pharisee who was praying one day in the temple? The publican was away in a corner. He couldn't lift up so much as his head before God. But the Pharisee was standing in a public place. And Luke records it and says with great insight, the Pharisee prayed with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not like other men. Now, the juxtaposition of the words is very important. His God was himself. He prayed with himself. God, I thank thee. And this is the problem with the Pharisee. And it's here that the Lord's Prayer comes in with a real help to us in understanding what is the cure for what Jesus is here exposing, because you will notice the Lord's Prayer doesn't just teach us, as we tried to learn when we were thinking about it, how to pray, but how to live. It's a prayer that is all taken up with God, not with me. But of course, you can't pray that way unless you live that way. So Jesus' appeal to us is basically an appeal to live our lives under the eye of God rather than under the eyes of people, to live for the praise of God rather than for the praise of men. And of course, that is the outstanding characteristic of Jesus' life, is it not? He says, I seek not my own honor, but the honor of him who sent me. In other words, the only thing that really mattered to Jesus was pleasing his Father. I don't know about you, but I find it just so challenging to apply that to my own life. Is that the only thing that ultimately really matters to me, pleasing my Heavenly Father who sees in secret? You see, the two rewards are really incomparable if you think of it. We must be maniacal lunatics to settle for the praise of men when the alternative is the approval of God. How could we possibly trade the one for the other? But we so often do. And the challenge of Jesus' words is, before it's too late, set the course of your life and live for the praise and honor and glory of God and for His approval and let everything else go to the winds. And that will cost us far more than we think. Let's pray together.